I'm Panini Pete, a professional chef with small town roots and a passion for one of a kind places. I'm day tripping down the back roads and main streets of America to prove that small towns are extraordinary destinations, each one rich in history and full of happiness, where people care about people and treat you like one of their own. They celebrate life, tradition, and one of a kind food culture. So join me as we gather all the local ingredients to serve up a big helping of small town flavor. to the Bartstown Farmers Market Pavilion. And one of the greatest things about this market here is it's not just a place to go buy produce. It's almost an education in food production because what is here is what is in season. It's right off the vine, fresh, nutritious, and there's even a sense of excitement and anticipation to see what's coming in. Are the blackberries in yet? Is the corn in yet? So I'm really, really excited to bring in here, introduce you to some of the farmers, and let's see what's growing in season. Come on. Praise from the sea, destined to the end. The season and the sun, a moment of your time where enliven your taste is the endeavor. From Stop. First thing you notice is a lot of great stuff here. Got some fresh collard greens today, yes, huh? Sir. How you doing? I'm Pete. I'm Maurice Apple Fagenbush. My friends call me Apple. Good. I'm glad you shortened that out. <laughs> Tell me about some of the uh, the stuff you have here. Got kale and collard greens, fresh homegrown peaches, and, this and all, cabbage. All grown. Grow all this? grown within seven are you miles the, of here. Are you the farmer, you actually grew this. Yes. Everything on the table here was picked after 12 o'clock yesterday, so it's less than 24 hours old. So my mother and father were in the fruit business. My father actually started in 1926. So, so being that your family was in the farm business, can you have any early memories of when you actually started working the farm, maybe when you were now, probably eight or 10 or 12? I, I remember, or I remember when uh, with the, the year I went to first grade in the spring, we had a freeze and killed the fruit crop. Dad planted a bunch of sweet potatoes and I drove the tractor in the spring planting sweet potatoes and then went to school and went to first grade that, that fall. And you were driving the tractor? I was driving the tractor planting sweet potatoes before I went to school. This is a producer only market. You cannot buy and sell. You have to sell what you raise. Oh, that's fantastic. You can't buy and sell. A lot of markets, they'll let you buy some or, and what's the difference if you go to the wholesale produce house and buy tomatoes and then come up here to the farmer's market and sell them, you go to the grocery store and get the same thing, you see. So even though farmers markets are kind of a popular trend and they're popping up, this is in the literal sense of the word a farmers market where the farmers come and bring. You can buy themselves. Right, thank Some you very much, Apple. You. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you. See you. Thanks for your time. Squash. It's called Trombacini. I love the little garlic, fresh garlic here. Mm -hmm. Look at that. And that's before it forms its big bulbs and you mm -hmm. pull it, because when it gets big, you pull it and dry it. And this is before so it gets to that stage. Mm -hmm. How long have you been farming? Well, I've farmed all my life. Great. But actually doing the farmer's market, I haven't been doing it for about eight or nine years. What do you call it? Roma, Roma green beans. Uh -huh. They're flat. I mean, they don't have no uh, string in it. No string. That's nice. No strings attached. Oh. Woo, 8.4. There might be a Cabbage Patch Kid in there somewhere. Just tell that. Wait, look at this. Purple cauliflower. Purple cauliflower. How long have you been farming, man? Huh, how been long? Been doing this since I was a child. You were just, that's all I've ever just done. a little wee guy. Never, that's all I ever have done. I've never had a public job. That's fantastic. Well, we appreciate that. 
We've sustained a lot of folks. What is that alien looking thing over there? <laughs> That's a karabi. Karabi. Boy, is that interesting. It's kind of a cross, they say, between a turnip and a cabbage. I find it very so much sweeter than a turnip once you get into the flesh part. So how, how would uh, you cook that? Is that something you do thin and slice or you got to roast it or I cook it like a turnip? I generally, you cook it like a turnip. I prefer, of course I like a lot of vegetables raw and stuff, I prefer <laughs> just to peel it and eat it raw. Just peel and eat it like an apple, bro. Right? Or, or cut it up and put it in a salad or whatever. You got a little garlic, look at this. You got garlic, you, did you braid that yourself? Here we are guys, not only is this a beautiful piece of corn, but this is the key ingredient in the story of bourbon in Bardstown. This begins our journey, we're gonna go look a little deeper into that. Come to Bartstown, Kentucky, there is no denying the influence whiskey has on the history of this town. So as we journey deeper into the history of American whiskey, we have to come and stop by the Oscar Getz Museum of Whiskey History. This place is a must-see in Bartstown, Kentucky. Now, Getz got into the bourbon industry shortly after Prohibition ended when he and his brother-in-law purchased the Tom Moore Distillery. Now, Getz was an avid collector of whiskey memorabilia, and thanks to his passion for whiskey, we were able to experience the story of American whiskey right here at the Getz Museum. And here's the room I really wanted to show you when we get into the journey of our history of American whiskey, this is the distilling room. And when you look here, this is where it all starts, from old moonshine stills, coils, talks about the whole fermentation process in here. The only true American spirit, fostered by Kentucky ingenuity. We're here in the barrel room where they have all kinds of containers on display of how the whiskey is packaged, from old flasks built out of one piece burl wood to the modern cooper shop. Right here, barrels, showing how they carved it out. You got the tools, drawings, sketches, every kind of glass bottle and flask you can imagine. This is a really incredible wall here because when you look at the history of American whiskey, the licensing and tax and the ability to legally distill whiskey was heavily regulated early on. And uh, obviously there was a lot of controversies in the whiskey rebellions over the years, but there is a lot of history in these documents. Here's a retail liquor license issued to Simeon Perkins in, uh, let's see, the colony of Connecticut. Dates back to 1759 liquor license right here on the wall. Here in particular is a patent that was issued to a gentleman for the useful use and improvements in distilling. This was issued in 1822 and signed by John Quincy Adams. This whole area right here is nothing but bottles of whiskey that are called medicinal whiskey. The only time you could get whiskey during the Prohibition era was if you had a prescription from a doctor. So if you look in here, incredible collection. We got Tom Moore right here, which came from the distillery Oscar Getz purchased right after Prohibition, right on up here to the Barton's label, which is what it became later on. And so many of them still have product in them. And uh, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, my back's hurting a little. I wonder if the medicinal effects are still active or I wonder what it would taste like right now. This is a lot, this is from the 1920s, it's still here, um, but we'll never know, it's sealed. Hey guys, I know it may feel like we're cutting you a little short on the history of American whiskey, but don't worry. Later on today, we're heading over to a family-run distillery to see how bourbon's made today. 
And better yet, we're gonna be back here at the Getz this afternoon to have a tasting with four of Bardstown's master distillers. Until then, we're heading over to the Civil War Museum to see how Bardstown fared during that era. William said to James, I'll meet you on the plains, but the boy will settle all scores. And year after year, his ghost still appears. We're here at the Civil War Museum of the Western Theater. We're going to go inside and see what it's like to be standing right here in Bardstown in the 1860s. Now, the buildings that house this collection are the former waterworks and ice house of Bardstown. So we're gonna go inside and meet up with my new buddy, Dixie Hibbs. Who better than to tell us about the history of Bardstown during the Civil War era? So let's go inside and check it out. Come on. What got inside a whistle and a drum Wearing the enemy down I wish we could walk I wish we could talk and March be a month of the year. Oh, this is going to be exciting. By the way, this is the fourth largest Civil War Museum in the country. And like I said, who better than to show us around than my buddy Dixie Hibbs, local historian and expert. Good to see you again. <laughs> Nice to see so you. So excited again. to be in right. here. Please tell us about well, the role that Bardstown plays. You know, this map here. really helps us to illustrate why Bardstown was important during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. We are right there. And we yeah. had really good roads that went up to Louisville, mm -hmm. that went south to Marion County, and on south where all the people traveling down to Tennessee in the war, they had good turnpikes to take all their supply wagons and all. So the north came in, they set up training camps, all these soldiers from Indiana and Illinois, Minnesota. Uh, Ohio, even Pennsylvania. We had a branch railroad here. It stopped at Bardstown, and they did ship from there. We have the original depot here. That so when you go up there, you can use your imagination and say, "Hey, they were loading barrels, they were loading military equipment, hospital supplies, and all that on the train." In Bardstown, we have so many older buildings. There's probably over 100 buildings that were here that the soldiers passed by. That's incredible. In the 1860s. So well, let's go ahead and get a, mm -hmm. an in depth look at uh, some of the specifics and Things the artifacts. I can't wait. Sing and rise up, rise up in the name of Pierce and Connolly. This display, of course, is a Union display, the Union soldiers. and. We try to give both sides equal time as we can. The Union Army came here in Bardstown in the fall of 1861. September of 1862, 22nd, Braxton Bragg comes through here and he brings 26,000 troops. Now this little community of 1,000 people, 26,000, they stayed here for 12 days. And that had to be good for the merchants. Mm -hmm. They bought all the food we had. And those officers and all those soldiers that came through here, the thousands of soldiers that came through Kentucky, I think all had a little taste or a sample of our bourbon because after the Civil War, within 10 years after the war is over, we are making whiskey right and left. So we really date the growth or the flourishing of our bourbon industry from right after the Civil incredible. War. I didn't know that. So the Civil War itself helped really whet the nation's appetite for well, Kentucky Well, you know, bourbon. every war the secret has to be out. paid for. Two dollars a gallon was the federal tax. That's a lot of money in the 1860s. Mm -hmm. Bardstown in his grandfather's house. The man he would be named for, Ben Harden, was an attorney and he had a wonderful home here in Bardstown that would later be the headquarters of Braxton Bragg when he came with his Confederates. He led his men of the 1st Kentucky Cavalry. He died in September 21st of 1863. And he married well, I hear. Yes, well, <laughs> he married the half-sister of Mary Todd Lincoln, which makes him the brother-in-law of the president. The Confederate general and the 
union president were brother-in-laws. When the song that is sung will hurt no one, that's when our day will come. So, Dixie, night has fallen and we're in a, this is a typical camp here. This during is, the uh, Civil War. Each one of the groups would have someone who went out and foraged to, to get food to bring in. They would go, maybe they'd buy a pumpkin or a turkey, or they would uh, go get something they could use, could cook for a uh, group of people. This little thing would have closed up all of your things you needed here in case you had uh, your papers, if you were uh, an officer and you had all those forms, official records. It's like a little desk, desktop uh, yeah, computer. Yeah, it is a That's traveling. That's a laptop computer that right there. It had everything right. they needed. You, and it, like a trunk. See how it closed up yeah. and you load it on your wagon. History is enjoyable. It also should teach us uh, things we should and shouldn't do. And even today, when the youngsters are coming in here and looking at this setup, they can't imagine um, all the things they had to do just to eat. Just learning about the going back to basics is important to know what you have to have and what you don't have to have. Singing, rise up, rise In the spring of 1865, guerrillas were really running around this part of Kentucky, and they had burned the depot over in New Haven, which is south of us. They uh, came to Bardstown, headed up to the Stone Depot, and Mr. Medcalf was the station manager. And they said, we're going to burn your depot. And he said, oh, please don't do that. Please don't do that. And he said, it's stone, you know, it's rocks. It's not going to burn very well. Well, we'll burn your floor. We'll burn your roof. And he said, my wife makes fine pickles. He passes around these big jar of pickles, and there's eight or ten of them, and they eat them all. Oh, yeah, these are pretty good. But we're still going to burn your depot. Not that good. So he goes, and he gets back in his cabinet, opens the door. He's been hiding this for a while. He pulls out two jugs of whiskey. Pretty soon they'd had enough whiskey, they weren't in the mood to burn the depot anymore. I wonder if this was the uh, invention of the pickleback. Do you think they might have done a shot of the, uh, the pickle <laughs> juice after the bourbon? There here, might right? be, Could maybe that was right it. Here yeah, right here in Barnstown, the pickleback. The pickleback. Right here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dixie, for taking time out again to show me around this wonderful town. The museum is incredible, and the way you helped bring it home and tie it together to Bardstown, the significance here was great. Great. Thank you so much for You're all very that. Welcome. Now, very you welcome. did great with the breakfast recommendation. All this talk of pickles and bourbon and running around, I'm hungry again. Um, well, any suggestions for, for lunch? We have a, a place that all the local people like and our visitors like. It's called mm -hmm. Kurtz, K U R T Z. K U R T Z. It's a German name, but it's a family restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's right across from Old Kentucky Home. You can sit there and think about Stephen Foster and his songs, eat the skillet fried chicken. Skillet fried chicken? Butter bean soup. Butter bean soup. And chocolate, chocolate pie. Chocolate pie. Kurtz yeah. is good for us. Sounds like you that's go, where we're you going. You go fill up and we'll go again. You haven't steered me wrong <laughs> yet, so I'm definitely going there. Well, thank you again so much. Right. Have a great day. We'll see you later. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. right, take care. Still ahead on Small Town Flavor. Kurtz's legendary skillet fried chicken. The desk here is the desk that family tradition has said. All right, what is going on here? Oh, my God. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Fresh, delicious, and prepared almond hoop on a train. Big debut in the Stephen Foster story.